Now what do you do as that support person, as that friend, as that caregiver, as that complete stranger that showed up on the scene? What can you do? The first thing is make sure the person is sitting down, lying down in a place where they can't be moved. They're not walking around a lot. They're not moving around a lot. That let's, let's come over here and have a seat. Let's calm the body down to reduce any further danger that they'll be in and also reduce any decision making they're going to be doing with regards to where they're going to stand, move, what they're going to get, what they're going to do. Now is not the time when they've just experienced some trauma for them to be making any decisions. Not a good time. Not a really good time at all. We also want to make sure that their body is warm. So anything that you can do, like cover their body with a blanket, to give them a jacket, something that warms their body is going to calm down that fight or flight system a little bit. So that's why you often see people who are perfectly fine at the scene of an accident or some kind of situation in which an ambulance had to show up, but they still put a blanket around people. That is for the calming effect and for the part of the body that's going to be hypervigilant and really anxious, it's going to keep that more settled, keeps their body feeling safer. And so it calms that part of the brain. They are also going to be often tempted to jump up and be engaged in a lot of things. And you're going to want to calmly and assertively get them to sit back down. They're going to feel irritable and anxious and feel the need to do something with their body because they're going to have all of this anxious energy. And it's okay for them to sit down because what needs to happen is when they sit down, their body is going to begin to shake and be and respond to all of the emotional feelings they're having. And they need a safe person to be with and a safe place to be in order for that to happen, for them to discharge all of this energy that they developed in trying to respond to this trauma. And that's going to help reduce later re-traumatization is them actually being able to process it right then and right there with someone, not alone. And to be able to say, I can just sit here with you. It's normal for you to shake. It's normal for you to be really shaky right now. You have to discharge off this energy that you had to build up in order to cope with what could have been a really, really crazy situation in a second. You know, something that could have been life threatening or something that you witnessed that was really scary. Your body's responding normally to that. And so to be that person that they can have that very vulnerable experience with is so important. You want to stay with them. You want to make sure that at least one person stays with that person the whole time. You do not want them to be left alone. So if you're thinking, oh, they need water, I'm going to go leave and get them water. You're going to ask somebody else to go get them water, or you're going to make sure that someone else sits with them while you go and get water. Really focus on the breathing and encourage them to keep breathing, but their body's going to need a lot more oxygen right now. So let's just really breathe together right now and to squeeze their hands and their feet. They can squeeze their own hands and their feet, but just to get keep the blood flowing and moving around and breathing. And then let's talk a little bit about once a person is possibly moved to a hospital. Hospitals can be very triggering for people. And so one thing that can be helpful for someone who may not have as much experience at a hospital, if you have any experience at all, any kind of narrating or asking the questions for them is really important. And to be able to say, you know, sometimes it's normal that people are going to be rushing around. This is pretty normal for hospitals. And just to really normalize everything that's happening in here. One part of it is also to normalize that it may take some time. So what kind of phone calls can I make? Can we call your boss and see if we can call out of work tomorrow? Are there any family members that I could call right now? Or that you would like to call? Here's my cell phone. Could we call some people together to let you know this happened? Is there anybody that you would like to know that you're here at the hospital right now? Is there anybody that I could help inform about what's going on? And sometimes you can even take their cell phone and just you'll write a list down of names and then you'll find them in the cell phone and you can make the calls. And they may let you know who they don't want to know. And you can ask, is there anybody that I should tell these people you don't want them to share about this happening just yet. Is there anybody who shouldn't know about it just yet? 
So it's like, I, you know, I'll call your brother, but you don't want your mom to know just yet. The last thing is after a traumatic event happens, often people are right there for the emergency. And then it's expected that by day five, six, seven, week five, six, seven, that person is surely over it by now. It is so important to follow up every day after a traumatic event for at least a week. Check in, hey, what you doing? How you doing? How you feeling today? Every day, as much as you can. Then after at least a week, checking in on a weekly basis, and this may seem extreme, but for at least six weeks. It is really important to remember that traumatic events up to six weeks, they can stay very fresh and you can also have re-traumatization from the memories, from dreams. Your body is physiologically not fully recovered from having experienced that event. And so it's so important to recognize it's been a month since that happened, but that person is probably still experiencing it as if it was yesterday. So I should probably check in on.